Welcome to the Metal Voice. Chris Slade has played with everyone. He's got a list. Mad for Man's uh, Earth Band, The Firm, ACDC, a little bit of David Gilmore. Jeez, and the list goes on and on and on. He's got a new album called Timescape. It's the Chris Slade Timeline. Timescape is a new album that's going to be released on July 19th on Brave Words Records. Hello, Chris. Hello, and thank you for the plug. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it's pretty cool. Um, I don't even know where to begin with you. Like, it, like to me, it's like there's, there's. I'll try to just narrow it down to a little bit. I mean, next time we chat, sometime in the future, we could talk more. But right off the bat, this new album, uh, Timescape, and I heard it, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it has a little bit of everything in your career there in terms of musical direction. Yeah, that wasn't intentional. I think that's just my um, influences, you know, coming out. Um, yeah. It reminds me of a, of an Earth Band album, uh, to be honest. It's very diverse, and it mm -hmm. shows off, I think, it shows off the band really well, uh, musicianship of the, of the players. So uh, I'm very pleased with the way it turned out. It wasn't intentional to make it diverse. Um, it just happened that way. Um, so, you know, you get really heavy stuff like um, Back with the Vengeance, for instance, mm -hmm. um, along with uh, Questions, which was an Earthman song. Um, so um, I tried to balance it with Running Order and stuff like that. So I hope I succeeded. I think it did. You know, I hear, you know, I'm listening to it and I hear Time Flies like, it's a Pink Floyd-ish type of song, right? Yes, yes, it's got that wouldn't have happened without, um, you know, without uh, Floyd, of course. Um, but um, it's just, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Tell that bird, will you? <laughs> okay. um, just shoot it. Be all right. <laughs> um, yeah, that wouldn't have happened, you know, and. The end of eternity, which comes after it, that's right, um, is uh, my attempt, if you like, at uh, comfortably numb, um, which we, uh, you know, we do on stage, and James Cornford, the guitarist, does such a great job on that. You know, you can never be David Gilmore, who could be, but um, James uh, does his own. Uh, thing yeah. with it and he does a tremendous job he, people are mesmerized in the in the audience and because he's such a great player you know nobody can be david gilmore nobody but, nobody vocal wise you know, guitar wise is just he's just a force to be reckoned with yes unbelievable very nice guy too actually yeah um, um I, but before well, we get into the david well, i'm going to ask you about david gilmore but Paul Davis, he's he's the bun, right? Yeah, bun. He's, I mean, I'm I'm assuming he's doing all the vocals on most of the tracks. He's um no, we have two singers. Mm -hmm. Stevie G is the other singer. Uh -huh. um, bun does usually does the ACDC stuff, but he just sings on on the original side. He sings on uh, Back with the Vengeance and um, Sundance. Um, okay. The rest of the stuff is uh, Stevie G and myself, actually, <laughs> which is uh, the first time that's ever happened where I've sung a, one of my own songs. That's okay. Um, that's so um, the band decided that I, because I, I demo all my songs, and I decide, uh, or we decide as a band, who's going to sing it. Um, and that turned out, they said, well, you should do it because... You know, it's uh, you're doing the whole backing track and uh, and you're singing it. Uh, so why don't you do it yourself? So that's that's, it. that's how that came about. So I'm very pleased the way it came together. And As I you say, the the Floyd influence was is obvious. Yeah, and I mean, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, of course, the, the and the Manfred Man is like completely there i mean the the the, the, the definitely the, the sound or of man for man's earth band ish 
it yeah. is is there definitely definitely yeah well earth band was a a great band Mus- musically it was a really really good band everybody were great you know were great musicians and it's the same with timeline they're world-class musicians nobody yeah. has heard of them properly yet um you know but uh it's obvious that uh you know, James uh, Comford and uh, Mike Clark, the keyboard player, and uh, everybody sings to a certain extent. And uh, they've been working together since they were 11 years old. Wow. And they're, thir- they're 35 now, you know. So they're a very tight unit. And uh, they can go anywhere musically that... Um, they want to go and we'll follow, you know, or even lead sometimes, just like uh, Earthbound used to. We never, with Earthbound, we never uh, captured the excitement that we could generate on stage. We could never capture that on record. So, um, you know, it was more like cream on stage, to be honest. Yeah, yeah. Than anything else. It certainly wasn't the '60s pop band, Manfred Mann. No, you know? no, 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 it wasn't. It was a, <laughs> it was sort of like Pink Floyd meets I don't know Alan Parsons Project meets Yes, yeah. you know, yeah. wow. something around there. You know, I mean, thanks for that. Yes, <laughs> and um, going back in time, blinded by the light. You know, what did how did that change? And we'll go back in time, Manfred Mann. We'll lead back up to your your new album. How did that change the band? I mean, to me, I remember, you know, I was a young kid. It was a big song, and it still is a big song today. Yeah, I, I go to the States a lot, and I hear it all the time, six times a day, you know? <laughs> and uh, it's on every radio station, on rotation, all the time. Um, same with Thunderstruck, of course. Yes, yes, um, yes, yes. But uh, it came about. Because uh, we were, we, uh, Manfred and myself, just the two of us, were given copies of Greetings from Asbury Park when it came out. And uh, I remember thinking that uh, Springsteen was a great writer and, you know, a great performer. I saw him live and he's just uh, a one off. He's just a tremendous performer, isn't he? Um, and, but back then, of course, you know, he was still a young man and he was, they were doing five hour shows. Yeah. You know, I know he still sort of goes towards the long ones. Um, but, uh, you know, it was, uh, it was a great experience seeing him in the, uh, seventies. Um, and we had this, uh, album, which had disappeared, to be honest, uh, didn't sell anything. Nobody bought it. And Manfred came up with it. He really liked this song. And Bruce does it so differently. He does it like a shuffle thing. Um, And Manfred changed it completely um, into the pop song. I'm sure that Bruce doesn't like it at all (laughs) compared to uh, how he wanted it to come out. But uh, the whole of Earth Band put... uh, our life and soul into that song. And Manfred came up with the original arrangement and we just, you know, put our influences on it. We being earth band at that time, um, just put our, our, our own musical taste and takes and ideas into it completely. Yeah. Um, to become what it is today. And it's a, it really is a classic record. Um, still, of course, as you say. You know? you know, there was a running joke in Canada. I don't know if the, the joke was, that song was massive here, right? In the US and Canada, it was huge. But there was a yes. the deuce was always, everybody thought it was the douche. Like I know. <laughs> did you have the same thing over there, like in the UK? Yeah, it's worldwide, that. It's worldwide. worldwide the, like a douche. And, and I was in the car with a friend the other day, and the song was on, and he goes, and he's singing the douche. I go, I don't think it's the douche. I go, it's the douche. But that is the most common misunderstanding of a word in any song. Yes, um, I know. And that came about by accident because uh, 
uh, Chris Thompson, the singer of Earth Band at that time, um, uh, has a New Zealand accent. And um, the recording head um, was not set up properly. So it made everything very sibilant. And uh, he was saying deuce. We didn't know what the lyrics were, by the way. We made the lyrics up, you know. And we'd sat around for hours going, what do you think? We were writing down literally around a record player, the whole band going, uh, what do you think that line was? Let's do it line by line. Okay. Uh, uh, so I came up with, for that line, I came up with wrapped up like a deuce, uh, wrapped up like a deuce. Like when you, you wrap your hand playing cards, that's maybe a British saying. But you wrap it, you throw it away like it's no good. It's a terrible hand. And we could not make out. And uh, I know the lyrics are now revved up like a deuce. So I, I got the R right. <laughs> but um, when you hear Springsteen's original, you know, it's, uh, we just couldn't make out what it was. Um, because there were no lyrics printed on the, uh, on the sleeve. And... How do you get a hold of Bruce Springsteen when he's an unknown, you know, he's still unknown. So uh, that, uh, you know, uh, what did you do? Make a transatlantic call to, uh, uh, can I have Bruce Springsteen, please? He's somewhere in New Jersey. You know, it's... Uh, Excuse I, me, Bruce, is that deuce or douche? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Look. Go away, scumbag. <laughs> what a great story. What a great story. <laughs> um, but I mean, and we'll go quickly through your history. Um, is it true that Jimmy Page and David Gilmour called you the same day yes. to play? Yes. Want to tell me about that? That That's like, I don't even, I don't even, I can't even comprehend something like that. No, me, by the way, even now. Normally, uh, the stars were aligned right, you know. I, yeah, I, I yeah, have no yeah. idea. Uh, phone rings, because there were no cell phones in those days. Yeah. Uh, Old-fashioned black phone, you know. Uh, rings in uh, in my apartment. And uh, like, hello. It's, uh, oh, hello, Chris. Uh, David Gilmore here. Uh, I'm putting a band together, and uh, I'd like you to be the drummer. Oh. Thanks a lot, Dave. And first of all, I thought it was a wind-up. I thought it was a friend of mine uh, pretending to be Gilmore. Um, and then, uh, you know, he he said, I said, how long? And he said, like, oh, three months, something like that. I said, fine. Uh, I said, I've got to tell you, though, um, I'm working. Do you know I'm with the Mick Ralph's band? And uh, he said, that's okay. He's doing it, too. <laughs> so, uh, you know, although I was in working with Big Ralph's, a bad company, in his solo band, um, came all like what he saw, and he got that band to be the nucleus of his band on the road, which was fantastic. Was that so, in his, that was a solo album, or was that Pink Floyd? I don't remember. That was uh, solo. Um, I think uh, it was called About Face. Yeah, probably his solo like second solo album. Yeah, yeah. I didn't. I didn't play in it at all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I knew the people did, but I didn't. Um, so we had to do that, and uh, you know, we did things like uh, Country Nam and um, uh, quite a few um, Floyd songs, and it was a great band. It, uh, it, you know, we used to play Comfort Nam every single night, yeah, uh, which was tremendous. Just One of the greatest tremendous. rock songs ever to be, you know, recorded, you know, uh, or or written. Um, yep. What's the coolest thing about David Gilmore that you go, wow? I never knew that. I, I never knew he was like that. Is there anything? Um, he, what you see is what you get. He is a very generous person with both his time and his money. Um, you know, he gives to the homeless. You know, he gives millions to the homeless, actually. 
It's all on record. Um, and he's a very cool customer. Um, he keeps his head under all circumstances. I, you know, we all got to get to know him or each other really well because we were on a bus together for a year, a full year. Um, so he used to, some, some mornings he'd wake us up playing at full volume, some heavy rock band or something. And, and he'd laugh his socks off that he'd woken everybody up <laughs> when we'd probably had a late night before on the bus. Have, have you ever got an invitation to, oh, you know what? I really need a drummer for this Pink Floyd lineup. Or maybe they couldn't do it back then because of Rick. Uh, you mean a Nick tribute Mason. band sort of thing? Well, no, no. I'm saying like for Pink Floyd, maybe Nick Mason couldn't make a gig or, or, or you know. Uh, no, that probably. never happened. I know Mick, Nick. Very Nick, well, Nick, actually. Nick. He's a funny guy. He is really funny. Um, and uh, yeah, I've never met uh, Roger Waters, but uh, quite the character, quite the character. Right, I've never <laughs> met him. So uh, I've met everybody else, uh, and I I knew Nick. Um, he I did an interview once while I was in the band with Gilmore. Mm -hmm. And he said, uh, somebody asked him about Gilmore. He said, oh, yes, David does have a rather unique style. I, I think it's called fumbly. <laughs> <laughs> so he's, uh, you know, he's out there as far as humor is concerned. You know, he's probably one of my favorite voices and one of my favorite guitarists, David Gilmore. He's just. Absolutely. What yeah, how could he not be? He's one of the greatest in the world without a shadow of a doubt. You know, they always, every interview I've ever read, he says he's a singer first and a guitar second. And that's why his guitar solos are so melodic, because he's always thinking like vocally or melodically what they would sound like. Yeah, yeah. I always say that, uh, and I, I love his voice too. I have always say that um, he's got an unvoice because he sings in English accent, for that's one. True. That's right. And uh, he doesn't sing in an American accent. Like most British European uh, singers do, because we do, we sing with an American accent, and uh, he doesn't. He sounds very posh when he sings, and uh, you know he is very posh actually, and uh, very intelligent also. So uh, I'd met him before a few times. Mm -hmm. Um, so it was great to find out that he, you know, that he had a sense of humor and he liked a beer and all those things. Um, and it was a fantastic experience being on the road with him it really was because he treated everybody great. That's good. That's good. And, uh, it just, and the, the, the tour kept getting longer and longer. So we ended up about um, nearly a year in the end because um, after I uh, had lunch after the Gilmore call <clears throat> I went back to the my apartment and the phone rings pick it up and it's hello see me page here I, <laughs> I thought Fred you're winding me up I knew I know it's you Fred you know no, 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 it's a, it really is, really is Jimmy Page. And me and Paul Rogers are, are putting a band together and uh, we'd like you to play drums. I said, I can't believe it, Jim. I I just, um, just an hour and a half ago, I just said yes to David Gilmore. And I thought, well, that's the end of that. And uh, he said, that's okay. We'll wait. <laughs> and they waited in the end for about a, nearly a year. Well, it was about a year for me to come off the road and, uh, you know, and be able to form what became the firm with Tony Franklin, Paul Rogers. Um, but I couldn't believe that. Both of them called on the same day. The two iconic uh guitarist in the world really 
um, most iconic. And um, did, did he show you around the Alster Crowley mansion or anything like that? No, 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 no. <laughs> uh, did, did, just, was there uh, anything? Uh, he, he's very he mysterious, just, right? So was there anything like what did you discover about Jimmy Page that you said, wow, I never knew that. You know, that's something. that he's a very ordinary guy mm. and down to earth. Okay. And uh, we discussed a few things like that, but only in a discussion like you'd have with uh, another friend, you know? Mm -hmm. There was nothing, oh, I bought Alistair Crowley's mansion. None of that came up ever. You didn't pull uh, out a black you, magic book or anything like that, no? Yeah. You know, nothing, nothing happened like that. Now, me and Tony Franklin once were in a bookstore. This is the truth, I swear. Mm -hmm. To me and Tony... We're in the bookstore, and uh, there was like a magic section, if you like. And I saw a book, and I, I said, "Tony, oh look at that! Um, I think I'll, I'll just have a, a browse through that." So I went to get it. I swear to you, and the book jumped off the shelf onto the floor, just like that. And I and I looked at Tony, and he looked at me. And we walked away <laughs> very quickly. Well, hold on a second, hold on a second. So the book is on the shelf high up. Is that what you're saying? It's not high up. It was at like head level, my head. Head level, okay. You're, and then you're and saying And I, I went to reach for it. I went like, you know, mm -hmm. reach for it. And the damn thing, I swear, I didn't touch it. And it just jumped off the shelf and went on the floor. And I, I think me and Tony walked away very, very quickly. <laughs> but we looked at each other like, what the hell happened there? I said, did you see that, Tony? He said, yes, yes, I did. Uh, you know, never maybe, was, maybe, maybe Jimmy Page was on the other side and he pushed it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he had a coat hanger the other side of the. Yeah. <laughs> did you guys did you guys ever want to do a like I remember when the firm I think it was radioactive that was the big song back in the day when the firm first broke. Yeah. And it was a it was a big thing because Jimmy Page is back, right? Led Zeppelin folded years ago, years maybe 6 7 years and after the yeah. firm comes out and radioactive becomes this sort of hit when MTV sort of was starting to take off. Um what was the momentum like? And and what was I don't think you guys played any Led Zeppelin at the shows, did you, or did you not? I don't remember. We played some at rehearsal, most definitely, but um, it never got to the stage. I don't think um, you'd have to ask Jimmy and Paul why or what happened. Okay. Yeah, um, but I don't know. I really don't know. Was there um, a fan expectation though? The fans would come, they'd see the firm, they go, maybe they'll play, you know, a couple of Led Zeppelin songs. Yeah. Yeah. That uh that did happen. Um and perhaps that's why it did so well or whatever. But um, you know, we never uh we didn't expect to play any of those songs. Okay. I thought we might. Um and as I say, we did try out a few things like mm -hmm. that. But um, I think Jimmy and Paul wanted to, uh, you know, they're in charge. It's their band, of course. Yeah. yeah. And uh, they called the shots. Yeah. So, uh, and they, were, they wanted to concentrate on their new stuff. And uh, Led Zeppelin, you know, one of my favorite bands of all time, you know, mm -hmm. of course. Um, and I did a Tom Jones album, by the way, with John Paul Jones on bass. Thir it's called 13 Smash Hits. I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, of course, you didn't have any credits in those days. Um, and all I got, uh, I did a couple of live albums with Tom and, uh, one was live in Las Vegas, and the only credit I got was, and on drums, we've got Chris. <laughs> live in Las Vegas, that was probably, what, in 1970-something or another, was it? Uh, I'm not sure. I think it was in the 60s, 69, perhaps. I think, my father, I think my father had that album. 
and it was sort of lingering around, you know, the record collection. My father did too. That's a coincidence. <laughs> <laughs> it's not unusual. Um, <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> I think What's Up Pussycat, is that the song? What? That song? Yeah, What's Pussycat. New? What's New what's Pussycat? New? That was the big song back in there, like in the 70s, I guess. Yeah, that was what, Bert Bacharach, actually. Yeah, he wrote what an that. incredible voice, Tom Jones, though. What an incredible oh, voice. Oh, the, the greatest untrained uh voice ever in my opinion power uh, power you know paul has a paul rogers has a wonderful bluesy voice um tom is more uh open he'll sing anything he'll sing blues he's singing a lot of blues these days actually um and very well too um he's 88 years old and he's, oh he's got Lord. It's He's incredible. got a new uh, album um, that's come out too. So, uh, you know, there's hope yet for me. <laughs> <laughs> How old are you? How old are you? Uh, 77. You know, um, that's amazing. That's great. You look good. You look great. Uh, I'm happy. I don't know about that. <laughs> um, too, too early in the day. <laughs> you know, for drummers, it's pretty rough. It's pretty rough for drummers. You know, it's very physically demanding as well as singers, right? They're, they're, those are the yeah, two. Yeah, singers and drummers got the toughest job, actually. Yeah, that's good to hear. But it's good exercise at the same time. It's coordination. It's muscle, you know. Uh, uh, it's, you know, um, uh, yes, all of that goes into it. Um, you, you know, your muscle memory um can only take you so far yeah it does um it does keep your um uh, musical chops alive if you like but um i've i've been lucky that uh, i've got the technique to be able to switch between say tom jones and acdc oh, that's know? that's a great segue that's a great segue <laughs> <laughs> so so, you know, you've worked with Jimmy Page, you work with David Gilmore, you work with Manfred Mann, you've worked with Tom Jones, and then you get the call for ACDC. Was, was, it, was yeah. it Angus Young who called you or Malcolm Young, or is it just their management who called you? No, it was the manager, actually. Uh, okay, guy this, called... time, this time it was the management. It wasn't the actual yeah. band. Uh, yes, that's right. Uh, Stuart Young was his name. No relation to Angus and Malcolm Young. Mm -hmm. but um, And he... Uh, he was managing. I was also with Gary Moore at that time. Yeah, um, talk about great guitarists. Oh, wow. yes. Um, and so uh, I got the chance to put my name forward to, to audition. It didn't give me anything, anything more than that. So I went to the audition with ACDC. And uh, no pressure, Angus and Malcolm put their chairs 10 feet in front of the bass drum. I went, okay, uh, back in black, looking straight at me, you know? It's like, <laughs> right, okay, you count in. So no pressure at all, of course. Yeah. <laughs> so well, you what, have to be sure what you're doing. All right, so back in black, what other songs do you remember on that audition? Um, there was a song I had to learn because nobody had ever heard it. It was on, it's on the Razor's Edge album now mm -hmm. called Rock Your Heart Out. Okay. So I had to learn Rock Your Heart Out, which is totally different to any other ACDC song. Um, you know, cause it's, uh, it's a syncopated bass drum. Which means, you know, it's all offbeat bass drums. Um, so, uh, unlike ACDC, because it's usually, you know, four to the floor, uh, quite often. I should say two to the floor, but four to the floor is a better phrase. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so, Rocky Heart Out was something completely different for them, as far as I could see. You know, I'm sure it is. Uh, of course, Thunderstruck came from those sessions also, which is but just so, uh, bef before you auditioned, they gave you the demo of Rock Your Heart Out, 
is that it? And they give you a list of the songs. Uh, no, it was like uh, learn these songs, you know, like uh, Back in Black. Uh, I can't remember the rest of them, to be very honest. I really can't. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but there were about three or four classic songs of ACDC. And then uh, at the end, they went, um, well, can you learn this? Just take as, take as long as you like. Uh, so I did it in about 20 minutes because it's like from nothing, you know. Did, nobody knew this song yet. Yeah. And it's a hell of a thing to learn that song, you know, with the, the solos and everything. And all the fills, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, and so Gary Moore there uh, gave me a good grounding because he wanted um, the show to be exactly like his records. But I mean, exactly. Mm -hmm. I think that's why Cozy left, actually. Because Gary wanted... Uh, Cozy played on the that Gary Moore album. Mm -hmm. And... Gary wanted it exactly like the record. Uh, I don't think Cozy does that, you know, not even copying himself. He plays, and that's the way I like to do it too, and everybody, I'm sure. So it was uh, it was a real, um, that ACDC audition. Um, I thought I'd done really badly, by the way. Okay. Were they looking at you in a very negative fashion or just no expression or... Uh, no expression. Um, Maybe a twitch? Had oh. Had their guitars like... on their laps. You know, they okay. were sitting down playing. And uh, they were playing back in black along with me. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Those guys, Angus and Malcolm, they don't talk. You know, they didn't. They just used to look at each other. And they knew exactly what each other was thinking. I, I promise you, it's uncanny. Never seen anything like it with anybody else. Um they would just, uh, they wouldn't even make a, a sort of quizzical um, expression. They wouldn't be like, hmm, hmm. It wouldn't, none of that. They just looked at each other and then they looked away and that did what, something what, different. Was Brian in the room too or was it just instruments? Yes, Brian. Or, yeah. Yes, Brian was singing, but he was over there somewhere. And uh, Cliff was also there. He was over there somewhere, but they were 10 feet from the bass drum. So they got their so, guitars, they're sitting there with no, and just looking at you. That's kind of intimidating, right? Very. I think that was the, you know, to see if you could put up with it or stand it or crumble or something. Because if you crumble there, you're certainly going to crumble when you get into a stadium, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so they needed somebody that could handle the pressure. And I've been doing it all my life uh, up yeah. to that point and still. You know, um, I I played uh, Madison Square Gardens for a week with Tom Jones when I was 19 years old with the Count Basie Orchestra, you know? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, pressure? Uh, so, what, were, were you <laughs> were you shortlisted into, like, coming back again? So, I thought I did really badly. Uh, Dick, the drum tech, helped me... Uh, pack up my kit after. They said, oh, thanks. At the end of it, they said, thanks a lot. We let you know. You know, it's the usual thing. And I thought, oh, well, that's the end of that. And uh, I draw, I packed my car and started to drive home. And I was so preoccupied saying, why did you, to myself, why did you say that? Why did you do that? Why did you play that? And I kept kicking myself. Uh, I got lost. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was an hour from my house, and I got lost. <laughs> um, and I thought, I better tell the missus that, uh, you know, I, I I won't be there for a minute. And so I called. She said, how do you do? I said, really bad. I'll tell you about it when I get back. Yeah. So... Pulled up to my house eventually, and she came up the drive, and uh, she said, "So you you did badly, did you?" I said, "Yeah, it was. It wasn't very good. I wasn't very good." And she said, "They just called to say you got the gig." <laughs> I guess there were no cell phones in those days. No, no, no. no, 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 no. Again, the the house phone 
And uh, all right, so so now you're jumping for before they called before I got home from the audition. <laughs> so you got the gig. I mean, what's yeah. the first thing you do? You run around the house a little bit? I don't know, jumping for joy. I... Uh, no, I went to the pub. <laughs> or that, or that, or that. All right, so first day on the job, you walk in, you come in with your drumsticks. What's it like, the first day on the job with the band rehearsing, I guess? Is you it know, recording or rehearsing? I honestly cannot remember. Uh, my brain don't work like that. It doesn't work chronologically. Um, uh, what did happen? They call you in. They call you it in. Was, Think uh, about it this. was a while. It took a while for the whole thing to come to fruition. Um, and they said, or the management said to me, you mustn't tell anybody, not oh, anybody, that you've yeah. got the gig. And this happened the last time, too. I was uh, in 2015 when I went back with them for two years, 2015, 2016. Mm -hmm. Um you mustn't tell anybody. So I had friends who are drummers, you know, and who are ACDC fans. And I couldn't tell them. You know, I said, well, I got this uh, I got this thing happening. I can't say anything about it. And uh, uh, Rob, who uh, said that he guessed it was ACDC um, because he knew they were... Um, auditioning you know mm -hmm. so but they're very secretive like that and uh so i couldn't say anything for months i mean months three four months and uh they said uh, you know you can't tell anybody that pain of death you know so nothing serious you know but, um so I, you know, I just didn't, I, I had to go through a whole, I think, I think it was three months or, and it, was, it was included a Christmas without telling anybody I was in ACDC. And they said, oh, you definitely got the gig. Yeah. Did they start paying you at least? Uh, I honestly can't remember. Again. <laughs> I, I would think if they, if they told you don't say anything, did you sign any contracts? Like once uh, you got the gig? Uh, yes. I don't know when the contract was signed, but I did sign a contract. Because only until then do you really feel like you got the gig, right? Yeah. When money starts coming in. That's yes. right. That's right. That's right. Because they could say, hey, you got the gig. Don't say nothing. Then suddenly you don't got the gig, right? It's yeah. Never know. Yeah. Never know. But, of okay, are, are you going into the recording studio now for Razor's Edge, or are you just rehearsing with them? What's What comes I'm, first? I'm trying to think. It was rehearsing for... Uh, the Razor's Edge, actually. And mm -hmm. where was that? Oh, it started in Dublin, in Ireland. That's where we started. Mm -hmm. um, then we moved, uh, after a few months, we moved to Little Mountain in, in Vancouver, Canada. Canada. Yeah. And uh, the whole album was done there, actually. There were some tracks that were used, backing tracks that were used, mm -hmm from Dublin, but it it didn't work, uh, basically. Um, and certainly didn't work for Angus and Mal. So, you know, they, uh, they decided to move. I had no part in this, of course, because it's like the firm, it's their, it's their band. Yeah, it's understandable. They decide, you know, they, they tell Brian and Cliff where to be and when to be. And uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They treated me the same, of course. Which, of course, you have to. Um, so it was, uh, and it's you know, it wasn't a new thing for me um, because I've been doing it all my life. Y you so know, I, I wasn't overawed by anything. No, no, absolutely. I mean, you're jumping to already establish major band here. I mean, it's it's uh, it's understandable. From the album, you know, one thing I noticed when the album came out, it was like a big comeback in a sense for the band. Like suddenly they're they're blowing away the charts, right? They're just thunderstruck as huge. Are you ready? Um, th this is a massive comeback. And yeah. I noticed Money the second Talks thing. Money Talks was the other one. Yeah. Yeah. And Money Talks, that's right. Huge. And I remember the drum sound being a lot bigger. 
than it was in sort of like the 4-4 of old, right? Keeping the groove, doing the 4-4. This was oh. more of a bigger drum sound. I mean, was there anything that you contributed to the – I'm assuming these guys were writing the songs. But is there anything that you yes, added to that album that you're saying, you know, that was me there. That was me. You know, the drummer didn't get the credit there. Well, I went boom, boom on Thunderstruck. <laughs> <laughs> but it was a big boom, boom, right? <laughs> right, yeah. Uh, Bruce Fairburn wanted, uh, I had to overdub that quite a lot. He asked me if I could, could you overdub on that one? Just go boom, boom when they go thunder. I go, yes. And he looked at me, he's, he's like, are you sure? And it's like, to me, it's a walk in the park. And to many drummers, that would just be a walk in the park. Um, so I don't know why Bruce was uh, surprised that I could do it and do it as many times as he wanted to get as big a sound as he wanted, you know. And when it came to live, I decided that's where my two flying bass drums came from, at shoulder height. Because I thought, oh. how can I re reproduce that? Oh, yes, yes, the, yes. The toms won't sound big enough, you know. So, And the two side bass drums were... Uh, very visual as well so um that's where that grew out of trying to get as big a sound as possible for thunder were all the songs written when you got into the band like okay these are all the songs just play these songs and let's just record i think this. uh we we worked up um fire guns mm -hmm. in the studio <laughs> okay but uh, of course the guys have the ideas in their heads and uh so to them it's not the first time they've heard this but uh fire you guns we we did work up from scratch okay uh they had the riffs of course and uh and i could play that fast yeah. thankfully um some people can't and i've been lucky even with this no unusual it was um that was a fast hi hat. Mm -hmm. That that up, that that up. You know, the brass make it sound like it's half time, but in fact, the hi hat's going crazy. Um, these days, uh, a lot of people will play it with two hands mm -hmm. um, on the hi hat. That is, uh, but uh, that was with one hand, and I'm very proud of that. And Looking. I used to play it, and other drummers would say, uh, oh, that's too fast for me. I go, what? And I couldn't understand that. Honestly, I couldn't. Um, but I've always had that facility. So, uh, you know, it's just hours of practice, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. I mean, huge success on that album. Did you think that album would be as big as it did, as it was? No, I did not. I had no idea. And I didn't know that Thunderstruck was going to turn into the anthem that it, that it is. I knew it was good. I knew some of the songs on the album were really good. Um, but I didn't think, you know, that's going to be, that's going to follow me around the rest of my life. <laughs> oh, big time, big time. Um, yeah. you Now you're on tour with them, ACDC. What's the sort of biggest myth about the band, or maybe what's it like being on the on the road with them? Like as as the audience member looks at them and actually being in the machine, what's the difference that you notice? I don't know if I'm phrasing the question properly. Um, what was the biggest discovery? Something you found out about the band? You go, man, I didn't realize they were like this. Um, it was Malcolm's band. It's not Brian Johnson's band. It's not Angus's band. It was Malcolm's band. Um, he ran the show musically and uh, any other way, I suppose. And, um, you know, Angus had the input with uh, the songwriting, of course, that uh, Malcolm was a genius guitarist, the best rhythm player I have ever worked with. Absolute genius. He was always on time. He never was to beat. And he just played fantastically well. Made my job so easy. Because um, I've, I've worked with many rhythm guitarists, you know. 
and he is with head and shoulders the best. And that's what came across. Did they treat um, you just as good as they did on, uh, you know, working with the other bands like David Gilmore? I would, would, I would assume they did. I mean, they I would, did uh, fine. They, 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 treatment was great. It was, I was one of the band. And yeah. um, when we toured first time, it was on a bus. Then it became two buses that the band were in because there were smokers and there were non-smokers. <laughs> so they were very, uh, very concerned about, uh, you know, about Brian, for instance, because uh, occasionally he had a cigarette, but not, not very many, you know. And uh, Angus and Malcolm were chain smokers. <laughs> and so they had a separate bus just because of the smoking. Uh, but the second time around, it was private planes, you know, and 80,000 people every single night. Wow. That's, that, that's, that's stress. You, that's, that's actually, that's why they were staring you down during the audition, just to make sure you don't crack under pressure. Yeah, that's right. Yes, I can see that now. But by then, I thought it was a bit, um, a bit strange. But yes, I can see. Because uh, if you crack under that sort of pressure with them staring at you, you're going to fall apart when it comes to 80,000 people, you know? And I mean, you also worked with the Axl Rose version of ACDC. What was it like working with Axl versus Brian? Um, I, I, I couldn't say it was like this with Brian and like that with Axl. Uh, they both did their job to the best of their ability. And mm. Axl... I was amazed at uh, the way Axel sounded, actually. I didn't know he had that voice. Um, and he used to warm up before a show for two hours every day and warm down for an hour afterwards. Um, and I know because I was next door to him. So, uh, you know, he'd have his piano there and he'd be playing the scales and singing the scales. And so he was very much um, concerned about his voice or the way he sung. And he sung great. It's for, not for, Brian. Yeah, yeah, you know. yeah, 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 of course. To me, I think that was the humbling moment for Axel because before then he was known as this guy who was always late, you know, sort of jumped, you know, ran off the stage. But when he went with ACDC, suddenly he was with his heroes. He, he said, wanted, that, yeah. He he was. He said that. I remember him saying that to me, actually. Uh, and he asked uh, Angus if we could uh, uh, learn certain songs. And Angus oh, he actually said, do you know? The? And Angus said, well, we don't, but we will by next week. So uh, we learned songs, you know, that Axel had asked for, like uh, Blood on the Rocks and things like that. Did you travel with um, Axel? Uh, yeah, I think so. Not all the time. He had his uh, his own entourage. Um, but uh, he said once on stage, um, uh, with this is when he was back with uh, Guns N' Roses, and he said, uh, oh, I went to, because um, he was never late, ever. Never, ever. That's the big late. shocker. That's what I'm saying. That was this humbling moment with ACDC. He said that uh, he'd been to boot camp with ACDC. He said this with Guns N' Roses. And they told me, if you screw up, you get the boot. <laughs> <laughs> but he treated you nice. He was a, he's a pleasant person. He, he, was, respectful. he was a great He was a great guy. Telling jokes and all sorts. All the yeah. time. He was a very, very nice person. I know people won't want to believe that. They want they'll want some horror stories, but it's they never happened. Yeah. And well, I he only grew knew. up. He basically he grew up. That's what it came. He matured over the years. That's all it is, right? Uh, okay. I don't know. I didn't know him before. I heard all the stories, of course, but uh I didn't know him before, so I can't compare, you know, all past right. Axel to this Axel. But he came. He was a he was a great guy. Chris, uh, in the few minutes that we have left, how many did, 
so ACDC, how did you guys part ways? Was it the band saying, okay, Phil's coming back? Uh, how did that make you feel? You feel like you've given so much to the band? I mean, what were your emotions like back then? Yeah, it was uh, uh, this was the first time the first when time. Malcolm called me. He says, nothing you're not doing, nothing you haven't done, but we're going to try Phil out on drums. Mm-hmm. And I thought, well, that's me gone. I said to him, that's me gone, Mal, because... Uh, you know, if it if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Is what is exactly what I said to him. Um, and so I resigned on the spot. And he said, "No, no, we want to keep you going, and we want to keep. We don't even know if Phil can play drums." I said, "Well, that's your problem now. Um, it's not mine because I'm not hanging around for anything." Sorry about that. Now, if I if I'd been my father at that time, I would have said, just sit there and take the money. Yeah. yeah that's what I would have done. I would go, yeah, sure, no problem. Just keep the keep the checks coming. Don't worry about it. I'll yeah. just like, you know, I'll go on vacation somewhere. So, yeah. I mean, what, was that the deal? Was that the deal that, okay, listen, we're going to have Phil play a couple of gigs. We'll have you as the sort of No, changing- there was not a, no discussion like that. It's like we're going to try Phil out. But what does uh, that mean, try Phil out, though? Like. Well, to see if he's uh, capable of doing yes. the job? Yes, okay. because that was debatable at the time. Okay. And I said, I, I handed it back to Angus and Mal and said, uh, well, Mal specifically on this call. It was great that he called me and not manager yeah, or yeah, anybody, yeah, 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 yeah. you know. And he was very, very nice about it, really he was. Um, and I was concerned for him because I knew I've done that a few times myself, and it's a terrible thing to have to do to tell somebody they're not wanted, especially and, uh, when they have the talent that you have, you know. And <laughs> but but I guess in all fairness, the ACDC, I guess fan base, they always want the close, the originals, the guys who you know from the oh, beginning. Oh, you can't, right? you cannot argue with that. Yeah, Phil yeah. is the original player. Yeah, and uh, he definitely should be the drummer in the band. I mean, there's no doubt about that. The fans get the wrong message for me. They they think I'm like uh, think I'm better than Phil or something. Or uh, you can't. It's like somebody other than Ringo being in the Beatles. You know, it's uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You can't argue. Oh, you know, uh, uh, Ringo's coming back. You know, Fred. Yeah. Oh, oh. Okay, you know you can't argue with it. Um, Ringo Starr, Phil Rudd, Originals, done lots of hit records with them. Um, you know you you just cannot say, oh, I don't. You know why? Why don't you keep me on or something like that? You know. But there, there's still like that hurt feeling inside. I'm pretty sure. You know. Oh, you, I you, was you give- devast- I I was devastated. That's why I resigned. It was like, uh, and my whole thing is, if it if it ain't broken, don't fix it. Uh, because I was doing demos for um, Ball Breaker at the time, yeah. just demos in a studio that they bought in London, a, a mm-hmm. small demo studio. So I've been working with them for like uh, two, three months already on those demos. And uh, this came out of the blue. It's just uh, a thunderbolt out of the blue. You were thunderstruck, that's for sure. I was thunderstruck. And then you're back in the band. Then you're back in the... How do they kind of squeeze you back into the band? You had like a different set of rules uh, when you get back to the band? like in What, in 2015, you mean? In 2015, yeah. yeah. Um, I got a call from the manager. um, And I was on tour with Timeline in Switzerland. Mm Mm-hmm. And I got this call from the manager. And at the end of it, this went on for about 30 minutes. <clears throat> and uh, I remember I remember saying to the manager at the end, I said, did this come from the guys? Like the request for me to rejoin? And he said, yes, of course it came from the guys. I wouldn't have called without, uh, you know, mm-hmm. <laughs> Angus or Mal telling me something, you know. Um, well, it was uh, Angus, of course, at the time. But um, um, that's sometimes that's this business. 
you know. And I kept saying to people, they'd be going, have you had the call yet? Have you had the call? Friends and anybody, fans, anybody. Uh, and I said, look, they are not going to call me, okay? They're just not going to call. Um, I know they're not. And then after about four months of this, they called. <laughs> so uh, I've, I've no idea why. Um, I never looked into it. I just accepted the job. You know? That's right. You're listening to your father. You just remember your father. Yeah, right? yeah that's right. <laughs> <laughs> Did you ever notice Brian Johnson? You know, he had that hearing issue. Did you see that on stage? Did you notice things were No, happening? you know, I said to Brian that it sounds great to me, Brian. Really, it does. Because, uh, and I, I said to a publication, I was using in ear monitors. So, and I said to them, um, I said to this publication, uh, I could hear the band better than I've ever heard any band. And then the journalist turned it around to say, with Axel Rose, it was the best I've ever heard the band, which is not what I was saying. But he, of course, he wanted to make um, some sort of headline. Yeah, yeah. So I'm saddled with that, that I thought Axel was better than Brian. And it's not true at all. And I kept telling Brian, I said, look, I can hear you really well, Brian. And, you know, it's not as bad as you think it is, mate. Um, but he was unhappy with what he was uh, singing. Yeah. So uh, that's when he stopped. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. I read his whole book. Great book as well. And let's get back to the Chris Slade timeline, the band. They're, they're going to release a new album, Timescape. July 19th on Brave Words Records. And the cool thing about this album is there's a second disc and it covers, it has a few ACDC songs. It has Manfred Mann songs, uh, Earth Band songs. It has, I'm trying to remember, Asia, right? There's a song by yep. Asia. Yeah. Uh, am I getting anything wrong here? Please uh, No, no. Please tell me. You're, I think I, I got it all. absolutely right. I got to look at the album to tell you. <laughs> High Voltage, Hell's Bells, Big Guns, Thunderstruck, July Morning, Blinded by the Light, Free, which I think is the Asia song, which is a great Asia yeah, song, by right. the way. Just... I mean, we'll, next time we talk, we'll talk about Asia and all the other stuff we missed. But okay. overall, I think it's a great sounding album. I'm not just saying that. The Thank melodies, you. The melodies sound fresh. You put it on, you go, wait a second, this could have been recorded in the 70s or the 80s or the 90s or Yeah, today. I always I see it as a as an Earth Band album, actually. Yeah. Which I had huge input into, you know, yes, of course. Yes. Positive um, messages, right? Uh, we will survive, uh, living the dream. The guys song. wrote that one. The band, the Timeline yeah. Band wrote that one. Great. Um, Very positive messages throughout the whole uh, original music, right? So it's great. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, it wasn't intentional to make it a positive message, but it is. That's okay. That's okay. Yeah. That's all right. Chris, I take in a lot of your time here. I appreciate your 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 time on this interview. I wish you all the success and thank you so much. Thank you very much indeed.